Hello, everyone. This is Rick with the Cyber Pro Podcast, bringing industry leaders out to you. Today, we have the CEO of Future Feed, Mark Berman. Mark, thank you so much for being on the Cyber Pro Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to be here, Rick. Thank you so much. Perfect. Well, let's kick it off. Tell us who you are and why you're awesome. <laughs> who I am? Well, I'm Mark Berman. Um, I think awesomeness is is a judgment of the observer, not the observed. <laughs> However, um, I've done a few things. I've been around. I've had a very varied career. And what that's led me to is a, a real need to answer a calling to help at this stage of our company to help the cybersecurity of the defense supply chain. Our, our soldiers, our people in the military are at risk every single day. And we're letting them down if we don't give them good cybersecurity to protect the equipment that they have, to protect all the things that they rely on. So I was compelled to sell my MSP business a few years ago so that I could really dedicate myself to that. And I'm using that as a training ground. And we are just now about to expand from serving the DOD with something called CMMC to um, using the magic that we've put into our platform for uh, all cybersecurity frameworks. So we're adding frameworks over the summer at a very rapid pace so that people can use the methods that we put in across commercial and other government spaces. I love it, Mark. And I know throughout the conversation, I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about when it comes to the DIB or the DIB or the defensive industrial base or whatever people are going to call it and the government regulatory side of the house. Just so viewers are, 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 are in the know, we're also going to have some bonus content on that. So keep, keep your eye out for all the stuff that we're going to be doing with Mark this week. Mark, I want to ask, in, in recent evolutions, have you noticed the cybersecurity landscape has changed or modified and, and is it for the better or the worse? Um, I think it has changed dramatically. I think it is for the better. Um, I was reading last week how ransomware attacks are down and payments are down. I mean, we are making progress, albeit slow, and it takes a while for all of us business owners to get it through our noggin that we have to protect the data that we have to not only to protect our clients, information, but to protect our own information. So I think I'm, I feel very positive and optimistic because I think people are getting the message. Um, and I think that there has been a dramatic change. And I think in this case, the government is leading the way. I'd be happy to talk about that more in the way that we approach cybersecurity as managers and as owners, as opposed to the way that we were doing it five, 10, 15 years ago. Let's let's actually just jump right in there, right? Normally I talk about, you know, what what emerging technologies or approaches or trends you're interested in, but I think the government is emerging with this new approach. So talk me through why you're excited about that. So it turns out that as much of as exciting and as technical as cybersecurity is, and we love to talk about whiz bang things that do everything, at the end of the day, it's about management and people. And I think it's taken this long for us to understand as a culture, a culture of business, if you will, that it really is about management and people, that cybersecurity is something, I think traditionally we built our IT infrastructure and we built it to serve the business, to make sales, to deliver service, to, to do whatever it was gonna do. Um, and then we would layer cybersecurity on top of whatever infrastructure we built. That is, that's, kind of how it worked. I mean, how many of you listening to this are thinking about, yeah, I bought the stuff that I needed to buy and then I hired somebody to secure it or I had my team secure it. That's the way it worked. Well, it turns out that that does not make cybersecurity actually function <laughs> productively. What you need to do is build cybersecurity into your business from the purchasing of technology, from the uh, review and the regular review of what you're doing, it needs hands-on as much as we talk about AI and it's absolutely an amazing tool and it can help define the difference between normal and abnormal. Most of cybersecurity is that statement. What is it about my monitoring, about my network, about my people? What is abnormal and what is expected? So we have tools that help with that, but ultimately baking cybersecurity into the cake from training, from using tools, from taking a look at the reports, not just having them be produced at some cadence and sent to your inbox with a quick delete button. All of that is what makes cybersecurity work. What has changed is the government is now getting behind in the frameworks, which basically set the standard for all of us. 
So whether you're talking about the military's supply chain, which is 800-171 or CMMC, or you're talking about more uh, commercial frameworks like NIST CSF or CIS, all of those things, it used to be, do you have policies and procedures? Now you don't, you don't pass if you don't have proof that you use your policies and procedures. Right. That's what's bringing America kicking and screaming, albeit by kicking and screaming to the point where we should have been all along, which is if you have a tool and it produces a nice report and right in the middle of the report, it says all of a sudden on the 12th of last, last month, you had all this traffic from South Africa or Brazil or from some, some server in Idaho through a VPN that you never had before and you don't know why it's happening. You never find out about that if you don't read the report, review it, and then do some sort of investigation, take action. Basically, when I say the government's leading the way, they're baking that into the cake and the controls. It's not just the report. It's just not just the technology. It's actually the review and the doing something about it, frankly. And and I appreciate the leadership. I love it. Mark, I know lately with the rules being published and, and going through public comment, there's been a lot of interesting updates by the Department of Defense on what they call ESPs or what we would consider an MSP or an MSSP. And you, you used to own one. So I'm curious, you know, what do you, what do you think about where this is headed for those managed service providers as part of helping those government contractors do work for the government? So I was talking to somebody who's in that category yesterday. Great small MSP for individuals running the, running the firm. They have a decision to make because the government, I think correctly so, says if you're going to handle as a contractor, any subcontractor, whatever it is, if you're going to handle our data, we have to be able to trust you. And if you, in turn, have outsourced to an MSP or an MSSP, we got to be able to trust them too. Um, and so the rule, the proposed rule, is saying that ESPs have to become CMMC level two qualified if they're going to handle customers who are CMMC level two qualified. That totally makes sense. It should make sense to everybody. They have access to the data. If, you, if you've outsourced your front line at the MSP to India to unvetted people, and they are now reviewing the government's data or they have easy access to it, a click and a cut and paste, and now the government's data is in our adversary's hands, that's not right. So you have a decision to make because the, your clients are going through the same thing. They need a gap assessment to see where they stand on the controls. They need to then take the somewhere between one and 250 PELAMs and like fix all the things that are basically foundational, none of which are particularly difficult, but it's just that we don't really have, not only are we, in most cases, we're actually doing the right thing. We're just not documenting that we're doing it. So you have to, you have to get that process in place that costs money. So you're spending between ten and twenty-five thousand dollars on a gap assessment. Then you're investing more into your technology. You may be fifty, sixty thousand dollars in the hole. Then you hire somebody to inspect you, and you're spending thirty to seventy-five thousand dollars if you're a small business to get inspected. Um, at some level, it's all going to equal out because all the contractors are doing that. And so therefore, everybody's got to raise their price a little bit, whether it's hidden in the in between the lines or not. Um, also, the MSPs, the, the MSPs who want to be involved, who are willing to say, we're not just going to do the right thing for our customers, but we're going to be able to have documentation that is recorded in a nice, organized way and be able to prove it. They are going to invest more hours than those customers. They should be charging for that. So what we're going to see is that some MSPs are going to be perfectly happy. I want to be mostly reactive. We'll fix the things that break and we'll we'll document that in our ticket system. But the proactive things that are required of me, that's just not me. So I think we'll see some, what I like to call mission critical MSPs developing in the marketplace who are going to charge a premium rate, not because they're just trying to make extra money, which they will be more profitable. But um, like, let's get it straight. You, you, you bill more hours, whether you bill it by the month or you bill it by the hour, you are billing more work to the same customer base. So um, those MSPs are going to differentiate themselves. They're going to send their um, employees for CCP training, not RP training. CCP training is a 40-hour course. So that's investing your guy's time or your lady's time 
into 40 hours of work and getting a test, an awesome resume builder, and an easy, if you're an employee, an easy way um, to be even more marketable and to be more expert. The people that choose to go down that road and think it's worth it, they're going to be the mission critical MSPs. Everybody else, you're probably doing a disservice to your client if you're going to kind of skim over it lightly and then just say that, oh, we're offering a compliance service where we're going to check a couple of boxes. Your clients will fail uh, in all the training that we've seen out there. Your clients will fail if you don't have the actual evidence to back up the boxes that you check. Mark, thanks for sharing that. We are definitely going to dig into some of that a little bit more on some of the bonus content. So definitely take a look for that. But let's end with a final fun question for you. What is your favorite piece of retro technology that makes you smile? My favorite piece of retro technology. Um, wow, that's, I was not expecting that question, and that is a hard one. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, this might sound weird, but it's so much easier and more fun to watch television, even though nobody watches TV anymore with all of the different feeds. So the, the good old TV, which is so retro, I don't love the retro TV, but the fact that a television these days is almost becoming retro compared to a computer or an iPad or a laptop, it's just more pleasant. You can basically watch anything you can ever heard of or dream of, and it's at the touch of a button. And I think it's pretty amazing because when I need to wind down, I need to wind down. And I, I love that the television and all of its streaming services have improved to the point where it lets me do that. That's awesome. Mark, thank you so much for being on the CyberPro Podcast. Sure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into the CyberPro Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on new podcasts and all of our cool bonus content.